Thank you very much, and thank you to the organisers for inviting me to this meeting. It's been very insightful to see how experts, world-leading experts from different areas are coming together to address a common theme. So what I'm going to do today is give you a practical insight on how very simple model organisms can be used to model the interaction between metabolism, ageing and disease development. In particular, glucose metabolism and dementia. So I work at UCL across two institutes, the Institute of Healthy Aging and the New Institute of Neurology. And we're very much interested in understanding the link between aging and disease development. Why? Because as Eric Verdin has already demonstrated, aging is the major risk factor in the most common diseases today. With increasing age, the rates of cardiovascular disease, dementia and cancer dramatically increase. This is, of course, an increasing problem with the increased life expectancy of the population. Over the last 10 to 20 years, in particular, dementia rates have dramatically increased, and it's now the number one cause of death in the UK. Over the next few decades, life expectancy is due to increase, in particular in low- and middle-income countries. This means that the rates of diseases like dementia are going to mostly increase in lower middle income countries. There's currently around 50 million people alive today with dementia. In 2050, this is set to increase to above 125 million. Most of these people will be living in lower middle income countries. So this is going to be a global problem, especially because there are currently no cures for dementia. Already in 2010, the cost of dementia was topping 1% of the global GDP. And next year, it's uh, estimated that the cost of dementia is going to be around $1 trillion. So a cure is urgently needed. With this in mind, we decided to look at the relationship between glucose metabolism and dementia, in particular Alzheimer's disease. The brain of a human body consumes 20% of the body's energy. And the brain is, can only metabolize glucose. So the whole energy requirement of the brain has to come from glucose. There's a highly sophisticated system delivering glucose from the bloodstream through the blood-brain barrier, which protects the brain from the, um, from the rest of the organism. And glucose is transported through into the neurons and into the astrocytes and the glia, which are the different cell types in the brain. As um, Alzheimer's disease develops, there's a severe reduction in glucose metabolism. This is a normal, healthy brain, and areas in red indicate a high uptake of glucose. As Alzheimer's degrees progresses, the rate of glucose metabolism dramatically decreases. Interestingly, the worse the disease, the worse the glucose metabolism rates are. What struck us, though, is that the reduction of glucose metabolism seems to precede disease onset raising the possibility that actually this is not just a symptom of the fact that neurons are dying, but it could be a driving cause of disease. Interestingly, this doesn't only happen in Alzheimer's disease. In frontotemporal dementia, this is a brain of a patient with frontotemporal dementia compared to a healthy control. And areas in red here show areas of decreased glucose metabolism. As you can see, in temporal dementia, like in Alzheimer's disease, there's a dramatic drop in glucose metabolism. This raises the interesting prospect that glucose metabolism could potentially be a target across a range of dementias. Why is this important? Because dementias are very complex disorders that often get misdiagnosed. In fact, a definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's can only be made post-mortem, when we can look at the brain of patients and we can see what type of proteins have accumulated there. So the broader the therapy that we can come up with, the less it's reliant on an accurate diagnosis for it to work. With this in mind, we decided to turn to our favorite modeling organism to try and address the question of whether increasing glucose metabolism could potentially improve the situation in dementia. Why do we decide to use flies? They're very small, they're cheap and easy to maintain, which means we can raise them in large numbers, which may, may, gives us statistical power to address the problem. Moreover, they have a very rapid life cycle. Even in the lab, where we're very nice to flies, they don't live much beyond three months. So we can look at the development of disease across the whole lifespan of the organism. 
Flies, though, although they're so small and so rapid, they have a highly complex system of organs. This has already been alluded previously in the John Bell's talk. Flies have a musculature, they have a heart, they have a brain, and they handle glucose in a way that's very similar to the way humans handle glucose. They have an organ similar to the pancreas, which secretes insulin, which, which induces the uptake of glucose in other organs. Importantly, it also has a blood-brain barrier, so it's had to work out a system in which to transport glucose from the fly's blood system into the brain. And this is very similar to the system used in mammals. Moreover, there's a very developed toolkit to address genomic and behavioral questions. Flies have been used in research for over 100 years, so there's very sophisticated genetic reagents available. Moreover, 75% of human disease genes have a counterpart in flies, which means what we find in flies is often directly applicable to the human disease context. The usefulness of flies has been underscored by the fact they have won six Nobel Prizes. So six separate groups of people involved in fly research have won Nobel Prizes, four in the last 22 years, suggesting that research with flies is still very relevant today. So we knew we were going to use fruit flies. We had to develop a disease-relevant model. So we, were, we decided to look at Alzheimer's disease because it's the most common form of dementia, and the running underlying hypothesis currently driving research is that Alzheimer's disease is caused <coughs> by the accumulation of a small peptide fragment called a beta-42, which is derived by the misprocessing of a much larger protein called APP. Now, yes, this, this hypothesis is slightly controversial, but I think there's enough evidence to suggest that there is, it, it's, it's still relevant today. So a beta-42 accumulates in the brain of Alzheimer's disease patients and triggers a whole series of events downstream, which leads to the death of neurons. So in order to address this, we decided to set up a fly model of Alzheimer's disease. What a postdoc in the lab, Onyxophila, decided to do was to express that small peptide fragment in the neuron of flies only during adulthood. This means that we can avoid any confounding developmental effects. So we switch on the A-beta peptide at day zero, and when we can follow the development of the disease across the whole lifespan of the organism. So these are days on the right and the number of flies still alive. As you can see, control flies can live up to 90 days, whereas flies expressing that toxic epita peptide are mostly dead by 50 days. And this is just to give you a visual of what we do. We house 15 flies in each vial, we tip them every couple of days, and we score them. And usually we're scoring about 150 flies for each lifespan. As well as lifespan, Onyx decided to look at the climbing ability of flies. This is a very powerful yet easy tool, which is based on the innate uh, desire of flies to climb up once they're tapped to a bottom of a vessel. So as you can see here, we tap flies to the bottom of these chambers, and flies then climb up. In order to climb up, flies need to be able to tell what is up is what is down, and they need to be able to coordinate their legs to climb upwards. So they need a well-functioning brain to be able to do this. As their brain degenerates, they can no longer do this as well. So we can score this, again, along the whole lifespan of the organism, and flies expressing the beta peptides, which have a so-called Alzheimer's in flies, can no longer climb after 30 days, whereas control flies are still climbing happily to the top of the chamber. So what we had now, we had a model which displayed toxicity in response to this peptide associated with Alzheimer's disease. We decided to ask the question whether increasing glucose metabolism would be able to ameliorate some of these phenotypes that we were seeing. To do this, what we did was express a glucose transporter specifically in neurons of adult flies. This would pump more glucose inside the neurons of the fly and should upregulate glucose metabolism. I mean, we're interested in seeing, will this make things better? So flies expressing a beta peptide alone are dead in about 50 days, whereas when we increased glucose uptake, what we can see was a lifespan increase of about 10 days. Now, this doesn't seem like much, but in humans, this would be a lifespan extension of about 18, 16 to 18 years. 
And bear in mind, these flies are still full of a beta peptide. So they have the toxic peptide present there. They just seem to be better able to deal with it. So they were living longer. Were they actually healthier? So as again, as a measure of neuronal health, we did a climbing assay. Flies expressing their beta peptide stopped climbing, in this case, around about 25 days. Whereas when we increased the glucose uptakes, flies could climb much better. So what we managed to find is that increasing glucose metabolism in the neurons of these flies seemed to make the phenotype better, which suggests that the drop in glucose metabolism that we see in patients is actually a driver of disease. We're obviously interested in trying to see, can we recapitulate this with a drug? And we turn to what is one of Alexander Fleming's preferred um, preferred drugs, metformin. Now, you'll hear a lot more about this drug tomorrow. And metformin is the first therapy um, prescribed to diabetic patients. It has a whole range of effects within a cell. For us, the most interesting one was that it upregulates the number of glucose transporters in the membrane of a cell, thus increasing glucose intake. So what we decided to do was to feed this drug to the flies and see if we could recapitulate that improvement that we saw by upregulating glucose transporters. We again did a climbing assay to analyze how the flies were doing. So the first two lanes represent control flies, and the rest are flies expressing a beta peptide, but fed increasing concentration of metformin from 10 to about 80 millimolar. What you can see is control flies are happily climbing to the top of the vial. Flies expressing their beta peptide now sit at the bottom. These are about 30-day-old flies, whereas flies fed increasing concentration on metformin are better and better at climbing to the top of the vial. Now, this is one of the strongest rescues I have ever seen in the lab. It always works. We've done it also at the Natural History Museum, and lots of people have managed to rescue beta flies with metformin. So what I've shown you is that we can address a question in fly, we can ask a question, does glucose metabolism um, have an effect on Alzheimer's disease development? We had to develop a model and then increase glucose metabolism, and yes, it can. And also, we've been able to recapitulate the effects of increasing glucose metabolism by feeding the drug metformin. Does that mean that metformin can be used as a therapy for Alzheimer's disease? The answer is maybe. It has been used in early Alzheimer's disease patients in small trials, admittedly, and in mouse models. And it has been shown to give some improvement in cognitive performance. However, there's a cautionary note to this tale in that other studies have found that long-term use of metformin in type 2 diabetes patients actually increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. This is possibly because in cell and animal models, it's been found that metformin can actually increase the processing of that protein APP, leading to increase a beta production. This is where studies in animals can feed back to human epidemiological studies and try and explain this co possibly contradicting data. So maybe metformin would be a valid therapeutic agent later on in disease development, once patients have developed Alzheimer's and have a brain full of amyloid beta, it might be able to rescue the ability of neurons to deal with that insult. Another thing which flies are very powerful tools is as a screening platform. So flies, as I said, are very cheap, they've got very rapid lifespan and a sophisticated genetic toolkit, which means they can be used as excellent platforms for screening drugs and genes. A number of labs have used um, Drosophila to screen for uh, candidate therapeutics for cancer models. I would suggest it also be a very, an excellent model to address the question of whether a drug can prevent disease or can rescue disease after disease onset. So we can trigger disease onset at a specific time point in flies, and we could feed the drug before triggering disease onset and after triggering disease onset. And we could then analyze the effect of drugs before in preventing and after a disease. Moreover, as I said, genes are very easily manipulatable in flies. We have just completed a screen analyzing 2,000 genes into 100,000 flies. 
And this wasn't impossible. It was a work of three or four of us over six months. We used a frontotemporal dementia disease model for this. And what we've identified is actually glucose metabolism is one of the pathways that can modulate disease development also in this frontotemporal disease model. So what I hope I've shown you today is that fruit flies, even though they're very simple and evolutionary, a long way away from humans, actually have a place in helping the understanding of how metabolism and drugs and disease can interact with each other. I'd like to thank everybody in Adrian Isaac's lab and Linda Parcher's lab, which I've been working with over the last five, seven years or so, the funding bodies, and you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nir. First of all, uh, thank you so much for making it so simple. Um, so I have just complicating question because it's so it's such a controversial area. So the flies that you make insulin resistant yes. are resilience to many of the effect of aging. But then if you're insulin resistant, you don't have so much glucose uptake. So did you do a combination uh, of that with the glucose to show? And I guess I guess before that the question is you. You claim that you increased the glucose uptake, but all you've done is you did some, did you actually show that you increased the glucose uptake to neurons? But then if you did, how do you explain the fact that the insulin resistant uh, flies live longer and, and better performing? So I'll reverse the question. Yes, I showed that upregulating glucose transporters could increase glucose uptake, uh, not in neurons because I couldn't physically do that experiment, but in other cells. I've also shown that upregulating enzymes downstream in the cascade, so phosphofructokinase, upregulation of that also improves the phenotype, which suggests that upregulating glycolysis can increase, can improve the symptoms. Um, it's true that flies with a reduced insulin uh, signaling, and indeed this has been tested across a broad range of animals, do have an increased lifespan. However, experiments in mice have shown that yes, you start off with decreased insulin signaling, but actually later in life they have a higher insulin sensitivity. So it seems like this dampening the system early on increases the sensitivity later. And in mice, what they've shown, if they, they drop the insulin signaling first and then trigger the beta phenotypes, they can rescue them. If they do it in reverse and they first give Alzheimer's disease to these mice, and then they drop insulin signaling, the mice do worse. So it does seem to be a thing related to timing. So one thing might be making an organism better able to deal with insults that accumulate with aging, which is what the reduced insulin signaling does. It's another thing going in to fix the system once this is broken, and that is after disease onset. So it might be, which is why I was saying, in flies, you could actually trigger disease onset at a particular point and see where the drugs have an effect before in making the system better able to deal with those insults or after in making the system able to fix the problem that's now happened. Does that, Dre? Thank you very much. <laughs>